Okay, well, welcome everyone to uh, another TCS Plus talk. Today, it's a great pleasure to have a double feature of Palak Jain and Sashet Sivakumar. We're going to talk about the price of differential privacy and their continual observation. And I guess before we begin, uh, I do want to encourage everyone to keep their cameras on. It gives Palak and Sachit a little bit more uh, visual feedback, makes the talk, even though it's on Zoom, as interactive as possible. And uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions. This talk is being recorded and we'll post it in our YouTube channel. Um, but after the talk, we'll have an unrecorded session where we can just hang out and ask other questions and uh, talk about whatever it is we want to talk about. Um, before we begin, let me say that we're always looking for suggestions. If you see a new result or something that you think would be great uh, for a TCS Plus talk, please, in our website, send us a suggestion. We're always looking for them and have great talks for the whole semester. And finally, let me thank the rest of the organizers, uh, which includes Clement Kanan, Rachel Cummings, Anindya Day, Sumega Garg, Gautam Kamath, Ilya Rajenstein, Oded Regev, Salil Shram, Noah Stevens Davidowitz, Tomas Vedic, and David Weiss. It's uh, quite a big team behind the scenes. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and hand the floor over to, I think, Palak, who will take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Palak Jan. I'm a PhD student at Boston University. And today I'll present results from joint work with Sachit, Eden, Adam, and Sophia. Sachit will be doing the second half of this presentation. So our work investigates the price inaccuracy of solving problems in uh, privately in the continual release model of differential privacy, as opposed to the standard model of differential privacy. And the continual release model is really, um, you know, the model that is talking about performing differentially private analysis in streaming settings where statistics are changing over time and they need to be monitored continuously. So there are many situations when aggregate statistics on dynamic data have to be released. And in the interest of time, I will mention the one that's become far too familiar in recent times, and that's publishing COVID statistics. So the table on this slide is from the CDC website, but you know, in the preceding years, countries, municipalities, even universities have had their own COVID dashboards. And we've all checked them at one time or another, I'm sure. So before defining formally this privacy model for um, you know, updated statistics on dynamic data, um, I'll discuss the standard model of differential privacy, which for comparison to the continual release model, we call the batch model. So in this model, the data input to the algorithm is thrown into the funnel all at once, so in one batch. And the algorithm produces one output that has to satisfy some accuracy and privacy conditions for this data. In contrast, in the continual release model, we're trying to formalize privacy in streaming settings where statistics change over time. So um, the algorithms here in this model we'll call mechanisms, just to kind of contrast with the batch model and not cause confusion. Um, and the inputs to these mechanisms will be received one at a time. And at every time after receiving an input, the mechanism has to um, output an accurate estimate for the data that has been received so far. So this model was also known as the continual observation model of differential privacy. And it was introduced by the works of Dwork et al. and Chan et al. from 2010. So just to demonstrate in this setting, at time one, the mechanism receives one input and it'll produce an output that's accurate for this data point. And then at time two, it'll receive another data point and it has to produce an output that is accurate for both the data points that have been received so far. So now I'll define privacy and accuracy formally in this setting, um, but I'll start with recalling these definitions in the batch model just for comparison. So privacy in the batch model is defined with respect to neighboring data sets. And neighboring data sets are data sets that differ in exactly one input. So here on this side, I've highlighted the second input as this differing data point. And we say that an algorithm is private if the output of the algorithm on neighboring data sets is epsilon delta close. 
So the definition of epsilon delta closeness is exactly as in the standard literature on differential privacy, but the details of this definition aren't going to matter for the rest of this talk. So for the continual release model, we're going to define privacy very similarly. We're going to also define it with respect to neighboring data sets. So again, I've changed the second data point for the visual on the side. And the main difference between the continual release model and the batch model is because we have many different outputs, the result of changing one input to this mechanism could actually change all future outputs of the mechanism. So the way that we'll handle this is we'll say that the will require that the distribution of the set of all outputs of the mechanism are epsilon delta close on neighboring data sets. So notice crucially that for this definition to make sense, um, the future inputs of, uh, to this mechanism can't change. So when the outputs of the mechanism change, we're not allowing future inputs to change based on this. And essentially we're requiring that the data set is fixed at the outset. In our paper from ICML 2023, from which we're going to discuss some results, we also formulate an adaptive model where you know we do allow future inputs to change based on the output seen so far. But uh, privacy is a little bit more tricky to define in this setting. So in this talk, we're just going to focus on this non-adaptive um, setting where the inputs are fixed at the outset. So that's privacy in the continual release model. And now we'll start by defining accuracy in the batch model. So accuracy in the batch model uh, is just, we say that an algorithm is alpha accurate if it's errors within some threshold with high probability. Um, and this general notion of error can depend on the function being computed. In this talk, we're just gonna be considering the absolute difference between the value of the function and the estimate that's output by the algorithm. And like before, the difference in this model, uh, the streaming model, is just that the algorithm produces many different outputs as opposed to just the one. And we can handle this by using an L infinity version of the error. So in this setting, we'll say that an algorithm is alpha accurate if the maximum error over all its different outputs is below some threshold with high probability. So just putting that together, the definitions for privacy and accuracy look something like this. The privacy requirement is that the set of all outputs of the algorithm are epsilon delta close on neighboring data sets. And the accuracy requirement is that the maximum error of the algorithm is below some threshold alpha with high probability. To see the difference between these settings and action, we'll use the example of summation. So assume that the um, input of each user is a single bit. In the batch model, the algorithm would the algorithm for summation would need to produce just one output for the sum of these inputs, and that sum here is six. Since the global sensitivity of this function in the batch model is one, which is that the function value can differ by at most one on a neighboring data set, this value can be released privately with only constant error by adding Laplace noise that scales with this global sensitivity. And in the continual release model with the exact same data set though, the mechanism would have to release the sum at every single time step. So at time one, that sum is one, and at time three, the sum changes to two, and so on. So one approach for releasing these sums at every different time step is to privately recompute the sum from scratch every time. And so to achieve the same privacy guarantees of the batch model using this approach, we have to account for the fact that we're producing T different outputs instead of just the one output. So we're going to have to increase the noise. And so just naively, we can do this by adding noise at each time that scales roughly with T instead of scaling with one. But we could also reduce the amount of error that we need to add at each time step using just some clever analysis. Um, so, you know, we can use the advanced composition theorem, which allows us to compose T different private mechanisms with error blow up that scales with the square root of T instead of scaling linearly in T. And so now uh, recomputing the sum at every time step requires, you know, error blow up that's not really square root in T if we have T inputs. Another approach that we can have that's fairly natural is instead of producing an output that's updated at each time step, we privately recompute every few time steps. 
since the sum can only change by one every time we get a new input, maybe we can wait a little while and just balance the error from waiting to update our estimate with the error from having to kind of produce all these recomputations and adding additional noise. And so this approach uh, allows us to solve the problem of summation with noise that's still, you know, t to the one third. Um, so it's still kind of polynomial in t. So the surprising thing is that even though this is kind of like the natural approaches that you would use in this setting, the seminal works um, in this setting introduce this powerful binary tree-based mechanism for summation that has error blow up that's only logarithmic in T as compared to the batch model. And so I'll start by kind of giving some intuition for how we can solve problems cleverly in this setting by going through this binary tree mechanism. Okay, so, you know, this is just the data set that we had before for summation that's on the left. And what we're going to do in the binary tree mechanism is we create a binary tree where the leaves are just the different inputs at all the different time steps. And then the nodes at the higher levels of the tree are going to be interval sums. So at the second level of the tree, you're going to take intervals of length two. At the third level, you're going to take intervals of length four, and so on. So now say that we have this tree of interval sums. How do we use these values to compute the sum at any particular time step? So say time step seven, um, we can notice that we can break up the sum at this time step into at most log t interval sums, right? So if we sum up one node from each level of this binary tree at most, we can definitely kind of produce the sum at any particular time step. So for t equals seven, I've highlighted the nodes that you would add up. So just overall, the mechanism will work as follows. Um, for each interval i in the tree, we publish a noisy count for that interval sum. And then once we have kind of this tree of values, to estimate the sum at any particular time step, we take kind of all the nodes that we've published so far, and we represent the interval from one to that time step t as the sum of at most log t intervals i, and then just add up these noisy estimates that we published. So how much noise do we have to add to these noisy estimates? Well, this will scale with the global sensitivity again. So we'll notice that like the global sensitivity of this kind of binary tree is roughly log t. Why is that? Changing one input can change at most one of the intervals at each level of the tree. And so that's how we get a global sensitivity of log t. And this means that we can kind of add noise that scales with this log t and then publish for each of the different intervals in this binary tree and then publish the entire binary tree. So what is kind of the accuracy guarantee that we get from this? Since we know each output is the sum of log t intervals and the error in each of these noisy sums is, um, you know, roughly like an independent Laplace random variable with variance log squared of t, then kind of the error variance in each uh, output at a time step is going to be roughly log cubed of t, which gives us a sigma value of log 1.5 of t. And we can use this to show that the maximum error is below log squared of t with high probability. And so this is really neat. This allowed us to go from a polynomial blow up in error to just a logarithmic blow up in error. And it turns out that this mechanism can be applied quite generally. So there's a long list of papers that do exactly this. And on this slide, I'm going to list just a few examples. I'm going to be missing out a lot of different papers. Um, but you know, there's a, a lot of these papers are cited in the manuscripts that we'll mention in a second. So there's a line of work that focuses on private online learning that uses the binary tree mechanism. I've listed a few of those works here. There are papers that focus on weighted sums and sums of real valued data. Um, there's problems that use this mechanism to solve graph problems. And finally, the last example I'll talk about is the problem of counting the number of distinct elements in a data stream. 
And I'll highlight one of the citations in um, this like last example, because this is work that we'll be presenting at New Europe's and New Orleans in about a month. So Sajid will also be talking more about this work later in the presentation today. So, you know, seeing this and seeing how generally we can apply the binary tree mechanism, a natural conjecture is maybe that all sensitivity one functions can be solved with only a logarithmic error blow up in this setting. And what we showed in our result from ICML 2023 is that the answer to this is no. There are problems that have sensitivity one and they're very closely related to summation and they require a much larger error blow up in the continual release setting as opposed to the batch setting. Not only that, but we also present, you know, for uh, the work from NeurIPS, different problems that are not related to summation that have sensitivity one that also require error blow up that's quite large. So in the rest of this talk, Sajid will explain uh, these lower bound results. So he'll explain why this error blow up has to be large for a couple of different problems. Um, and don't worry about the problem definitions. He's going to formally define these problems very shortly. So I'll hand over to him, and he's going to start with uh, the maxim result from 2023. Well, I have a question before we go on. Um, uh, yes. This, this binary tree mechanism, does it, mm -hmm. it works when the statistic itself is decomposable in a way? Is that all the... Yeah. Yeah, it's really important that you can break up the statistic into these um, like sub problems in a really nice way. Um, the count distinct problem may be one where you would assume that this is maybe not possible, right? Because the number of distinct elements can't be broken up like that. But we actually find a way to get around that uh, for count distinct. So sometimes for count distinct, we end up kind of cleverly using the noise um, in the way that you would use it in the binary tree mechanism, uh, but we don't actually end up thinking about the problem as being broken down in the same way. So there is some requirement, but you can get around it. Yeah, so just to sort of add to that, um, I think this decomposition is a very nice way of thinking about it and makes the analysis simpler, but what's actually happening is you're just adding a very specific type of correlated noise um, to the function value at each of these intervals. Um, and it turns out that <clears throat> that type of correlated noise can be used even places where this type of decomposition doesn't work, as Palak was saying. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe let me share screen. Yeah, this is also like a good stopping point if y'all have other questions on this first part of the talk. Um, I had one question. Uh, yeah. Okay, you can hear me. Yes. So I was wondering if you adopted this, um, if you move to the other definition of differential privacy, where the future um, inputs were also allowed to change, then would this binary tree mechanism also work? Yeah. yeah. Um, why is that? I don't, I don't see a clear way. So uh, um, the proof that we do actually adapt some um, proof techniques from cryptography to kind of show the indistinguishability, the epsilon delta indistinguishability in the two worlds. But essentially kind of the noise that you're adding in this binary tree mechanism is, you know, correlated based on the inputs that you've seen so far. So really the noise that you're adding is not based on kind of the inputs um, that are coming in. So it's not gonna matter so much if the inputs are changing adaptively based on the output so far. And like really crucially, the reason why the indistinguishability holds is because it holds so far and therefore privacy must hold so far. And therefore for the next time step, we can just do what we expected to do. Um, that's kind of like a very high level description but um, if we have some time at the end of the talk, I do have some slides with um, the actual like definition of this adaptive input setting. So maybe I can kind of talk about yeah, that. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, we will go on. 
So as Palak said, um, you know, there's no reason to restrict to single bits. We can look at other problems as well. And the first problem that we'll be interested in is maxim. Um, so here we consider d-dimensional bit vectors. Um, and the problems that we look at will be very related to summation, except on these d-dimensional bit vectors. Um, okay, so, okay, sorry, one sec, yeah. So the first problem that we look at is max sum, um, which is outputting the highest of these d-coordinate sums. And this problem is related to some very natural tasks, such as empirical risk minimization and optimization. Um, and it's actually an abstraction of those tasks. Um, okay, so in the batch model, we can use the Laplace mechanism to privately solve um, this problem of releasing max sum with just constant error, because the maximum sum um, just has sensitivity one. Um, so in the continual release model, there are two natural approaches for solving max sum. So the first one, um, which Palak already talked about, is again, privately recomputing the problem from scratch every few time steps. Um, and this would allow us to solve the problem with er error that is polynomial in D. Um, and the second is to privately compute the summation each coordinate separately using the binary tree mechanism, and then just choose the highest coordinate sum um, that we've computed. Um, and this allows us to pro solve the problem with error square root of D, um, and polylogarithmic in T, which is, um, yeah. So these are two natural approaches, um, which give very different types of bounds. And so the question is, sorry, uh, someone unmute? No, uh, okay. Um, so the question is, can we do better than this? Can we hope to achieve polylogarithmic in both T and D simultaneously, for example? Um, and in fact, it was consistent with all prior work in the continual release model that some version of the binary tree mechanism could be used to achieve a polylogarithmic error guarantee for in both in terms of both of these param parameters. But in our ICMR work, we showed that this is not possible. In particular, we proved that max sum requires error that is polynomial in either the data set size t or the number of coordinates d. Uh, and we also show similar bounds for related problems such as sum select, which is like the arg max version of maxim, which is sort of outputting the index of the highest coordinate sum instead of the sum itself. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about how this lower bound works and go into the proof. Okay, so first I'll give some intuition for why we might expect this problem to be hard. Okay, so for the data set that's shown, um, the values of the coordinate sums are two, five, three, and six. And so the max sum for the entire data set is six. And this really gives us information about just one coordinate sum. In contrast, in the continual release model, we learn information about many coordinates and how they vary over time. For example, at time step two, the maximum value is two, um, which is the sum of the first coordinate. At time step five, the maximum value is three, which is the sum of the third coordinate. Um, similarly, the maximum value at time step 10 is the sum of the second coordinate. Um, and the maximum value at time step 14 is the sum of the fourth coordinate. And hence we've revealed all the coordinate sums at various time steps. Um, now this might be an artificial example, but this kind of gives an intuition for why we might expect this problem to be harder in the continual release model because it reveals a lot more information. Okay, so our key idea is to formalize this idea um, by using the extra information from solving max sum in the continual release model to design an algorithm solving a hard problem in the batch model. And as indicated, the problem we consider is releasing D coordinate sums, which is also called the one-way marginals problem and is like widely studied in differential privacy. Okay, so the problem is defined as follows, but again, given a data set of N entries with D coordinates, and we want to release the sums of all of the coordinates. Um, just to reiterate the difference between the batch and the continual release model, I'll use N to represent the data set size in the batch model and T to represent stream length in the continual release model. And so this is when interested in coordinate sums in the batch model. And so I've used N. Okay. 
The error of an algorithm for this problem is defined as the maximum error per coordinate, where the error per coordinate is just the difference between the true coordinate sum and the algorithm's estimate of that coordinate sum. And sort of a seminal work of Bunn, Ullman, and Vazan gave a theorem that lower bounds um, the error of any differentially private algorithm for this task. In particular, they show that every approximate DP algorithm for coordinate sums has error that must scale with either square root of the number of coordinates or um, the number of data entries. It's a pretty strong lower bound. OK. So now I describe the reduction from coordinate sum to max sum. Um, in our paper, we use inputs that are just bit vectors. But to make things really simple here, we'll also allow inputs to have minus ones. OK. So. So we consider a data set with d coordinates and size n to demonstrate the reduction. Um, in this case, n and d are both set to 3. Um, and we'll use a continual release mechanism m for max sum as a black box. So for the first n time steps, we directly send the data set entries to mechanism m without any modification. Okay. Then we want to get an estimate of the first coordinate sum. And we'll achieve this through padding. So what we do is we send ones in the first coordinate and zeros in the other coordinate until the first coordinate sum is the maximum. And sending n such entries is clearly enough to achieve this since the data set itself is only of size n. And then the first coordinate sum can be deduced from the maximum value at this time step. You just have to subtract n from the estimate that we get. And this gives you an estimate of the first coordinate sum. Now we sort of refresh the slate by getting rid of this inflation in the first coordinate. We simply send minus ones in the first coordinate and zeros in the other. If we didn't have minus ones, we could also achieve this using bit vectors um, by sending ones in the other coordinates instead, but don't worry about that. Um, but the point of this is it restores the differences in coordinate sums to those in the original data set, which means we can now do the same thing for the second coordinate. So we can send ones in the second coordinate and zeros in the other until the second coordinate sum is the maximum. And as before, sending n such entries is enough to achieve this. And again, the second coordinate sum can be deduced from the maximum value at this time step for n. And so we can repeat the same, uh, um, same steps to get estimates of all the coordinate sums. Uh, and observe that the total number of time steps is 2 times d times n, um, 2n per coordinate, n for inflating the coordinate sum, and n for refreshing the slate. Uh, any questions about this reduction? Okay, so now I'll explain, you know, put the pieces together. So finally, let's take a look at the reduction as a whole. It takes in a data set of size n with d coordinates and releases the d coordinate sums. Um, it uses this black box a continuous release mechanism for max sum that runs for two times dn time steps. If the continual release mechanism had error alpha for this many time steps, then the maximum error of any of the outputs for the coordinate sums is at most alpha. Um, and so the algorithm A overall for coordinate sums has error at most alpha. Um, and recall the lower bound uh, of Bun, Ullman, and Vazan for any differentially private algorithm for coordinate sums. It says that the error has to be at least square root of d comma n, the minimum of those two. Um, and setting the number of coordinates d and n in order to sort of get the best possible lower bound, um, this tells us that um, the error alpha has to be at least omega of t to the 1 by 3, uh, which is polynomial in t. Um, you can also show that um, you can get a lower bound of square root of d with some additional work. Um, it's obvious for this specific value of d that we've set, but we can extend this to get a lower bound for all values of d with some additional effort. Um, so that's it for the maximum reduction, maximum lower bound. So this is how we get the omega of t to the one by three. And I think this is a good point to take questions if people have any. Maybe a small question. How important it is that you can insert minus ones also? Uh, it's not very important you... that you can insert minus one. So one thing you can do instead is you can insert zeros in the first coordinate and ones in the other coordinate. 
So if you did that, then like this coordinate stays the same, but the other ones go up. So it has the same effect. Okay, okay. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, great. Um, okay, so now I want to describe another way to use this type of reduction where we embed like multiple versions of a batch problem um, and reduce it to solving a continual release problem. So we'll describe a more sophisticated um, sophisticated reduction. Um, and this will be the lower bound for counting distinct elements. So I'll start by defining the problem. So we're given a stream of items. Um, from some universe, and at each time step, an item is either inserted or deleted. The distinct element count is defined as the number of items that are inserted more often than they are deleted. Okay. Um, so let's understand with an example. So for the stream in the slide, the universe is just fruits, apple, banana, and strawberry. Um, apple is not inserted more than it's deleted. It's inserted once, it's deleted once, so it doesn't contribute to the distinct element count. Um, banana is inserted twice and deleted once, so it's inserted more often than it's deleted, so it contributes to the count. And strawberry is inserted as often as it is deleted, so it does not contribute to the count. And so overall, we get that the distinct count at the end of the stream is one. Okay. Um, so now let's discuss the cost of privately releasing distinct element counts. So count distinct is also a sensitivity one function. Um, each data entry affects only a single item. And so it can't change the count distinct um, by more than one. And so we can actually add Laplace noise to get the same kind of constant error that we saw for other sensitivity one functions. So in the batch model, this can be, um, this is simple. So in the continual release model, you can use the same recomputing based algorithm that Palak talked about um, to get error again, t to the one by three by just recomputing periodically. But it's not clear that we can do better. So can we use some version of the tree mechanism, for example, to achieve polylogarithmic in T um, in this setting? And the answer is no. And in our new paper, we show that a polynomial in T, uh, T blow up is necessary. In particular, we show that the worst case error of any algorithm, differentially private algorithm um, for, for this task has to be at least T to the one by four. Uh, where T again is a time horizon. Okay, so like the previous lower bound presented, here too, the key idea is to reduce from an appropriate problem in the batch model. And in particular, we reduce from approximating a number of inner products in the batch model. And I'll define this problem formally in a second um, to approximating count distinct in the continual release model. Okay, so let's now define inner products in the batch model. Uh, we're given as input a data set of size n, where each person's data is a single bit. The algorithm is also given a query vector q, which is also just a sequence of n bits. And the goal is simply to compute the inner product between the data set and the query vector, which is just the sum of the component-wise multiplication of the two vectors. Okay, so this is just inner product. The error of an algorithm for this problem would just be the absolute difference between the estimate and the true inner product um, by natural notion of error. But in reality, we're not interested in a single query vector, but many query vectors. Um, and the error of the algorithm would be the maximum um, error for any of these inner product queries. So the maximum over all of them. Okay. So again, a seminal work by De Niro and Seem shows a lower bound for releasing inner products in the batch model. In particular, it shows that every differentially private algorithm that has to release big O of n inner products, remember n is the size of the data set, uh, has error at least square root of n. Um, it proceeds via something known as reconstruction attacks for those of you who are familiar. Um, okay. So at first glance, inner product and count distinct seem somewhat unrelated. Um, so now we reason about how a mechanism for count distinct can be used to answer a single inner product query. And our final reduction will extend this to apply for many queries. Okay, so the input data set is simply a bit vector. And first we want to map it into an input for count distinct. And we do that using something called an index transformation procedure. What we do is as follows. 
For data entries that are one, we insert their index into the corresponding stream. Um, so for example, if you look at the data set on the left, the ind ind indices one, n minus two, and n minus one have data entries that are one. And so the corresponding indices are inserted in the data stream that we're mapping to, as shown on the right. And then for the remaining data entries that are zero, we simply add bots to the, to the data stream. So observe that the produced stream consists of items in the universe one, two, so on till n. And at each time step, an item is either inserted or deleted, or we have a bot operation and nothing happens. Um, and so this is the a type a valid stream for count distinct to take. Okay. So now we're ready to explain how to use a count distinct mechanism to solve in a product. So again, we have a data set Y and a public query vector Q. So what we do is we apply this index transformation procedure to both these vectors um, and concatenate them to obtain this large stream. Um, so X data is the index stream that corresponds to the data set and XQ is the index stream that corresponds to the public query vector Q. Okay. So now observe that the inner product of the data set and query vector um, is the number of common entries in these two index streams that are produced. So why is this the case? So um, the inner product will be the number of indices whose entries are one in both the data set and the query vector. And this is exactly the number of common entries in the corresponding index streams since an item is inserted in the index stream if its entry is one in the original vector. Okay, so it's easier to picture these as sets of items. Um, so you, each of these streams has a set of items and we're interested in the size of the intersection of these sets, which is the number of common entries. So notice that since the query vector is public, the size of the yellow circle on the right is public information. On the other hand, the data set Y is private but the size of the left yellow circle, which is the number of items in the X data stream, um, is simply the distinct element count at the nth time step of stream X, um, because I insert X data at first. Okay. And finally, uh, the size of the union of the two sets is equal to the distinct element count at time step 2n, um, which is the number of items in either the X data stream or the X query stream. And it's equal to the count distinct value of these two streams concatenated on top of each other, as shown. Okay, so now the point is with some basic set theory, the size of the intersection, which is what we're interested in, is the sum of the sizes of the um, sets with the size of the union subtracted. And we can just relate this to the count distinct values of various index streams. Um, so this is the count distinct value of the data index stream plus the count distinct value of the query index stream um, minus the count distinct value of the two index streams concatenated on top of each other. Okay. And so just keep in mind that formula. Um, so this has given us a way to relate inner product to count distinct. And we'll explain how we can use this relationship to formally re um, reduce like multiple inner product queries to the count distinct. Uh, in the continuous release model. So again, as input, we're given a data set of size n and a number of query vectors. So for the first n time steps, we directly send the index transformed version of the data set. So we apply this index transformation, and then we simply send that um, to the mechanism. And then at time step n, we get an estimate of the distinct element count of this index transformed stream. Next, we send the index stream corresponding to the first query. And hence at element at time step 2n, we get an estimate of the distinct element count of the concatenation of the index streams of the data set in this first query vector. And so recall from the formula at the bottom left that we discussed earlier, we can leverage these estimates along with the public query vector q um, to estimate the inner product between the data set and the first query vector. Okay. 
And so now all we do is we delete the index stream corresponding to the first query vector. And this is similar to refreshing the slate in the previous reduction. And now we can simply repeat the process with the second query. We simply add in the index stream of the second query vector. Um, we get an estimate of the inner product between the data set and the query vector two concatenated with each other. Um, and then again, we can estimate the inner product um, by post-processing these distinct element counts using the formula on the bottom left. And we can keep doing this to get, um, you know, the estimates of all of the inner product queries. So in total, we can repeat this for all big O of n queries um, to get estimates for all of the inner product queries. And the total number of time steps is n squared because there are n queries and each query um, involves two n time steps. Uh, any questions about this reduction so far? Okay, so let me just put the pieces together again. Uh, let's take a look at the reduction as a whole. It takes in a data set Y of size N and releases big O of N inner products. Um, and it uses a mechanism for count distinct that runs for big O of n squared time steps. Um, if all of the distinct element counts have error alpha, um, the maximum error of the inner product estimates is two alpha, since each estimate uses two distinct counts um, from the stream. And now if we use this theorem from Dinur and Nassim, which lower bounds the accuracy of private algorithms for estimating many inner products, um, we know that the maximum error is at least square root of n. And using the fact that n is equal to square root of t in the reduction, this gives us a lower bound of t to the one by four. Um, and so this is the lower bound for count distinct. Uh, so also a good point to break for questions before I sort of get to the last piece of this talk. Sorry, can you repeat why do you do n squared time steps? Um, okay, so let me just go back a little bit. Yeah, so basically for each um for each query, we have to send the index stream for the query and then delete the index stream for the query. So that's like two n time steps per query. Uh there are big O of n queries that we're interested in answering, and so the total would be two n times big O of n, which is big O of n squared time steps. Okay. Yeah. This is because the lower bound that we have for the batch model is for roughly O of n queries. So we're trying to solve that. Yeah. Somehow this feels like you're not using the full power of the online algorithm because you're only using the results at some very distant intervals. Do you think it's possible that this lower bound is not tight or? Um, good question. So this is true for max sum as well. Um, so in max sum, we only use some of the time steps and it turns out there it is tight because we have the t to, we have a t to the one by three upper bound. It's a good question about whether the same thing applies for count distinct. Um, and honestly, we don't have a great sense of what the correct answer is. We know somewhere between t to the one by four and t to the one by three. Um, there are some natural classes of algorithms that I won't describe where you can get this lower bound up to t to the one by three. Um, but we were at some point thinking about algorithms that didn't look like natural as natural and um, seemed somewhat promising though we hit a dead end. So it, it could go in either direction, I think. Um, it's it's a great question for anybody who's interested in this stuff. So we know that for, at least for algorithms or mechanisms that depend only on kind of the value of the function at the time step that you're interested in, for those types of continual release mechanisms, we know that the lower bound can be brought to t to the one third, which is what 
and for that we actually have an upper bound so there we do have tightness but because we have this upper bound of t to the one third um you know it's not clear whether we could do something more interesting to kind of match this t to the one fourth lower bound yeah thanks okay so just finish up with the talk um so what do we do when we're faced with strong lower bounds? So we've discussed two strong lower bounds that grow polynomially with the time, one for maxim and one for count distinct. And you know, these are important data analysis problems. Maxim abstracts various optimization problems, count, di count distinct is an important data analysis primitive. So, you know, is there any way around these lower bounds? So the first thing we should just, I think, cry at the injustice of the world because, you know, things didn't work the way we wanted. It would be nice if, this wasn't true, but it is. But more practically, I think our lower bounds are worst case. So one natural thing to do is to see whether we can do better for like natural streams. Um, and in our paper on count distinct, um, we explored this for the problem. Um, in our Neurith paper, we explored this for the problem of count distinct. So to explain our results, I'll firstly define a stream parameter called the maximum flippancy. So the maximum flippancy of a stream is the maximum number of times that an item switches between being present and being absent in the stream. So just to explain this with an example, um, let's say I have the data set, data, data stream on the left. Now I'll argue that the maximum flippancy of the stream is two. Uh, and that's because the flippancy of all of the items will be two. And so I'll just talk about the flippancy of a single item. Um, so consider apples. So apples are inserted ones and deleted ones. So they switch between being present and absent twice. Um, and so the flippancy of the apple is two. Um, you can do this for all the items. And if you go through this example, you'll see that the flippancy of all of the items is two. And so the maximum flippancy is two. I think the flippancy of the banana is just one. Well, I guess it's inserted in the beginning. So if you count the initial insertion, it goes from being absent to present. So in that sense, it's two. Uh, well, but it never goes back to being absent because it's inserted twice. Oh, good and point. Then sorry. Yeah. yeah, sorry. A slight mistake in the example, but the maximum flippancy is still two. Good point. Um, okay. So the point is that the maximum flippancy um, is small for many natural streams because there are many cases where we don't expect like repeated insertions and deletions of the same item. Okay. Um, and the algorithms that we've seen so far don't improve for streams with low flippancy. For example, one natural approach that we discussed is re recomputing ever so often. Um, and this would give you t to the one by three error as discussed. But the point is, you know, it's always t to the one by three error. It doesn't improve for low flippancy streams. So in our Neurith paper, we show that we can actually improve on this for streams with certain flippancy. So let's say we knew that the stream had maximum flippancy w. Um, we actually give a private algorithm that achieves an accuracy of square root of w polylog t. So if you think of the maximum flippancy as constant um, or very small, this would match the polylog T error guarantees that we get for many other problems. Um, but initially to do this, you need to know the flippancy. And so we actually show that um, with a lot more work using an algorithm that tracks a proxy to the maximum flippancy using something called the sparse vector technique, um, we can achieve this for all streams without prior knowledge of the maximum flippancy of the stream. And so the error of this mechanism adapts according to the stream. Um, for streams with low flippancy, it gives you better error. And for streams with high flippancy, it gives you worse error. Um, and we think this is a promising way to potentially get around lower bounds by identifying stream parameters that you know natural streams may behave better on. And so sort of getting around worst case bounds um, using that. Um, we actually show using the sequential embedding technique again that this bound is tight in terms of the flippancy parameter. Mm -hmm. Won't get into that. Um, but yeah, so this is one way around these lower bounds. And like Palak said, we'll be talking about this at New Lips next year. So, sorry, next month, um, if any of you are there. 
Okay, so just to conclude with some open problems, as already mentioned, getting sharp bounds for count distinct in the continued release model is an interesting open problem. Um, and you know, it's not the correct answer lies somewhere between t to the one by four and t to the one by three. So it'll be very interesting um, to characterize exactly what it is. Um, we discussed the binary tree mechanism in this talk. Um, there are a few other algorithmic tools in the continual release model. The sparse vector technique is used quite a bit. Um, but in general, we don't have too many other algorithmic tools. So developing more algorithmic tools for this model would be interesting. Um, and so we've identified lots of problems with strong lower bounds now. So sort of more work on instance optimality or sort of parameterized approaches. Um, like the one presented on the last few slides um, to sort of get around these lower bounds would be interesting. And, you know, I think we're still scratching the surface. We discussed a few functions. There are many other interesting functions in the continuous release model, more sophisticated data analysis tasks. Um, so sort of when you can sort of improve over composition and do more interesting things, or, you know, even proving that you can't, both of those would be interesting. Um, and so with that, I will... I'll stop and, you know, we're both happy to take questions. Okay. Are there any questions for Palak or Sachit? I have a question. Uh did you have some notion of what are the other parameters that could be useful for some of this other, like flippancy in the account distinct? Did you have any, any ideas of what could be other notions of these parameters in the other problem that you discussed? Yeah, so that's great. Sorry, Palak, you want to go first? I think in general, like it would depend very much on the problem, but the intuition is that a lot of these bounds depend on you know, some upper bound on, you know, what we expect these worst case parameters to be. So I don't, I don't have specific problems in mind, but Sajid, do you have any like specific problems there? Yeah, I mean, in maxim, for example, like how often the maximum coordinate sum changes, I think is probably a good one. And my guess is you can prove things based on that. Haven't formally tried to, but I'm yeah, my or at least like um, the selection problem. So like the argmax version of maxim, where you just want to keep track of, you know, say like you have a bunch of different mechanisms, you want to keep track of the optimal one. So you're just keeping track of like the index of the maximum sum. Uh, there at least like you could, you know, look at how many times this like optimal one changes. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but I'm guessing there are similar param parameters in many other problems as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. So if uh, the person that was interested in the adaptive setting um, is still around, like we're, I, I did dig up those slides so I could mention um, a couple minutes about that if people are interested. Okay. Yeah, that'd be good. I was wondering if this was still being recorded and it was necessary, I guess. Okay, let's, let's, let me take us off the recording then. We can just...